The biggest announcement, which Durant already mentioned, is that we have church at the beach next week. Everybody say church at the beach. Church is not canceled. Church is at the beach. So we sure hope that if you are not out of town, that you will join us at Little Creek Park. And that you would see Michael Grass if you have questions about it or would like to go ahead and sign up so that we can prepare well for food. He has a sign-up sheet in the foyer and he will be available after service to chat with you about what we need. Um, And then that starts at 1030. But if you forget and you drive here, you'll see a sign on the door and you can still join us. We're going to stay for uh, several hours and enjoy a time together and the beach. Also in your bulletin is the new reading plan. September starts on Friday, and so we don't want you to be behind. We're starting in Romans. And then uh, we have life groups starting in two weeks. Um, The first one that I want to mention, well, go ahead. Yeah, with that slide, there's the slide that matches the card that's in your bulletin. And so you can find out a little bit about each group that we have starting or that we have going on right now. And then if you would go on the website, go back one. There's a button by each group that says, I'll be there. And this is a great way to let that group leader know if you have questions or to let them prepare by clicking that link. And then you can send them a quick email that lets them know if you have questions or if you'll be joining them for that group. And so we would love to have you sign up that way so that we can be prepared well for you. If you don't do it, no big deal. Just show up and be a part of it. Um, Here at Coastlands, we really believe in discipleship. And one component of that is life on life. And you can't do life on life if you don't know each other. So uh, a small group or life group is a great way to meet some new people. And you might just meet a really significant relationship that changes your life. You could also just meet some new friends and learn something. But you might meet a person that changes um, your life significantly. I know that that has been the case for me in the past. Some groups have been life-changing. Some have just been a great way to meet some new people in my church family. So give it a try. If you've never done it, give it a try. Join one of them for the six or eight weeks and commit to uh, doing life together. Uh, The other announcement is about Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. This is one of our life groups. It's eight weeks long. Uh, There is a $30 fee for materials. It starts on the 11th. So we've got exactly two weeks, but you you do need to be registered by the day that time that one starts to um, have your materials and be ready for class. So if you have any questions about that one, I'll be in the foyer and I have books available if you would like to sign up for that. It's also online and you can register, pay, do everything online if you would like to. Okay, um, Miss Vicki and Heather, if you guys would come up here. These are uh, two of our groups that are going to be starting um, in two weeks. And we're going to just have them tell you a bit about theirs. They are uh, specific studies and so we want you to know what they cover. All right, um, I just got your little fancy card. Um, the one thing I want to talk to you about is, is soap, because, um, yeah, they do all those ones at the dark 30 in the morning. Um, yeah, I don't do dark 30 in the morning. Um, so I just decided that maybe since the guys are already here Tuesday night, that hey, if the ladies want to join me, we'd do soap, and then we'd have one that's not at dark 30 in the morning. So, um, and you all know what soap is, so you can figure that out. And But please join us at 7, back here. If we get big enough, we'll move into the big room. Otherwise, we'll play in the prayer room. Um, and the other one is discerning the voice of God. Um, it's primarily for ladies because Priscilla Schreier is the author of this. Um, and if any of you didn't know, I thought it was really cool, that she is Tony Evans' daughter. Um, So she comes from a very strong background of Christian walk. Um, She sets this up with, are you hearing what God's telling you? Do you recognize his voice? Um, And she does it in such a fashion as to awaken your heart to the Holy Spirit. And I just I uh, did it last year, um, and I was really, really impressed. This is an older picture, so if you go looking for the book, um, look for the new one. It's a white cover, and she's got the words written in gold. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, yeah, my place. Okay, so our group is called Freeway, and life sometimes is messy. Your car breaks down, your cat dies, your kids are hanging from the ceiling, or you want to hang them from the ceiling. Um, (laughs) And yeah, I have Velcro too. So you wonder, hmm, hey God, this isn't what I signed up for. So 
where do you go from there? So if your struggles could fill up a coffee cup, maybe the Atlantic Ocean, no matter what it is, Freeway is a really fun study that goes through six comprehensive steps to change your life. And Tim and I and God want to go on that journey with you. And we can't wait. It's going to be fun. I might not have known yet. And there is a typo. It's not called freedom. It's called Freeway. And it's Thursdays at 7 at the Bollinger Home. Um, and also, I'm a Texas girl, and so I'll report that our Foursquare Church plant that's in Galveston on the coast getting hit, they're still alive. So. Yeah. Thank you for bringing that report. Well, it's good to be back from vacation. Thank you for not blowing up God's church, you know, while I was gone. One of the great things about having a great team, and I talk to a lot of pastors that say, well, I can't go away because if I leave, the church will fall apart. I was talking to a pastor who had been in our community. He's been there 18 years. I think he had uh, 280 days of vacation on his books that he hadn't used yet. I mean, like, that's more than half a year. Um, And I thought, wow, that's interesting, because if if the leader's gone and the church falls apart, then I haven't been doing my job of equipping the saints for the work of service. That's what Ephesians says. So if I'm doing my job right, then other than some, you know, vision and so forth, this thing should just hum right along. So I appreciate all of you and your uh, your investment in, um, in the kingdom of heaven. So today, we kind of finish up this part of the series of, uh, is that really in the Bible? And I had to really stretch it for this one, because um, I I wanted to speak about something and address something that is very pertinent in our news today, and it's something that is grieving me and many of my colleagues in the church, uh, leaders. And it is this idea, it is this ideology of racial tension, racial division, racial name calling, racial superiority. It's it's this whole piece, you know what I'm talking about, every single day for the last two weeks, it's been in the paper. And I know I'm late late to the party here because I've been gone, but it's like, I'm going to address this, and we're going to look at what the book says about it. We're going to start with the end in mind, and we're going to move forward from the, we're going to go back to the beginning, and then we're going to move forward to where we are today and how we respond as Christ followers. Is that okay? I'm not going to give you rhetoric. I'm not going to give you my opinion, although I have lots of opinions, as do all of you, by the way. And every time I look at this from a scriptural perspective, I am, I am reminded of my own upbringing, which all of us have an upbringing, good, bad, or indifferent, and we have seeds that were planted in us that have grown into a maturity, and I'm not saying a godly maturity, I'm saying they have grown to full maturity in us, and there are some things in our life that need to be laid at the foot of the cross, and they need to be crucified with Christ. As I looked at the newspaper of what's happened right here in our state, I'm reading all of this rhetoric, I'm reading reading responses, I'm reading commentaries, I'm reading all of the mess that is around us, and I'm saying, oh God, where have we fallen to? Here's my opinion. This is ridiculous. But you know what? It's not about a monument. It's not about a flag. It's not about... Any of those distractions that may represent what's in somebody's heart. 
It's about our heart, folks. And our heart must be aligned with the cause of Christ the way He intended it from before the beginning. Because the heart of heaven is very different than what we see here on earth. These are the four questions that we're going to answer here today. And we're going to have four passages of scripture that are going to make a framework. And you're going to have to fill in the pieces of this. But one question number one is, is um, as we look at race, redemption, and unity. You notice I didn't say racial reconciliation. We heard that, we hear that so many times. It's never been consiled to begin with. You can't reconcile something that's never been consiled. Consiled, I don't believe, is even a word. But it's, it's one of those things. We're trying to do something that has not been done outside of heaven. Let me, let me say that again. We're trying to do something that has not been done, nor will it be done, outside of heaven. But as Christ followers, we must be diligent. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are in the already, but the not yet. Do we believe in healing? Absolutely. We prayed for miracles here today, for healing and so forth. Has it all happened? No. It has not all happened yet. Ultimately, there are some of us, we are going to be completely healed when we get to heaven. And we are going to die on this earth, not seeing what the kingdom has shown us in the scripture. Does that mean we just give up and say, well, whatever, whatever? No. What it means is, as Christ followers, we have to be diligent about this. And we have to know where we're going. The first question is, where are we going? Everybody shout, heaven. Heaven. That's where I'm headed. Where did we start? Well, we're going to look at the book of Genesis in the beginning, creation. Where are we now? Well, we can look at the newspaper and see where we are now, but I want to give you the Christ perspective of where we are now in New Testament. We're going to look at some of the things that Paul wrestled with uh, at the Oropagus. And we, we look at it through the eyes of not much has really changed. And then, what do we do as Christ followers? What action do we have to have in order to allow ourselves to be conduits of the kingdom of heaven coming to earth today in our life with the bloody newspaper that we open up on a regular basis? we got our hands full in the next 20 or 30 minutes. I want you to start in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This is the end of where we are going, folks. Where are we going? We're going to heaven. What does it look like in heaven? I want to know what we are preparing for. Because in heaven, the kingdom of God, there's no sickness. Amen? Amen. There's no strife. Amen? Amen. There's no division. Amen? Amen. Revelation 7, 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, say nation, tribe, say tribe, people, say people, People. language, say language, Language. standing before the throne and before the Lamb, and they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. When else do we remember from Scripture where they were holding palm branches and waving them? Palm Sunday celebrating the coming of the king that they thought was going to save them from the Romans, but in reality, his blood on the cross was going to save every nation, tribe, and tongue. And here we have the palm branches waving, reminding us of the redemption of every human being that will bow their knee before Christ and declare him as Lord. It's not any particular race, tribe, tongue.
tongue or language. It's every. Matthew 24, if you want to study this more, look at Matthew 24. People ask all the time, when is Christ returning? The last Sunday of this year, I'm going to preach about the second advent. After we come through advent, we preach about the second advent. What does it look like for the return of Christ? And here's the thing. When we look at the return of Christ, it has to be that every nation, tribe, and tongue has to be in heaven. Therefore, every nation, tribe, and tongue, every ethnic group needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then the end will come. Matthew 24. So, here, just as in looking at the newspaper... And you have all the neo-Nazis, and you have the white supremacists, and you have all of these groups clashing and so forth. Here's a theory that I have. I told you I wasn't going to share my opinion. Please don't call me a liar, but I'm going to share my opinion for a moment. Actually, I'm going to form it in the form of a question so that I'm not sharing my opinion. Um, but could it be that God in his mercy will not allow some of these racists into heaven? Because for them, it would actually be hell. Having to live with all these different people from all over the earth. It's just a question that I've had, okay? Not sharing any opinions, but... Here's here's a thought, folks. If we forget where we're headed, where are we headed? Then the pitfalls of the journey become our focus. The statues, the flags, the, the, oh, they looked at me wrong. Oh, they're different than me. What? That becomes the ignorant focus of our journey. We were praying in the prayer room today, and, and I think it was Heather that brought up. People want a cause to ride. They want to jump on the bandwagon. They want something to live for. They want some, you know, whether it's the the ethical treatment of of animals and whether it's the you know this or that we want to ride some sort of a cause something to live for that is outside of us so when things like this come up people that don't even care about the statue ride a cause they're distracted by a pitfall on the journey when our focus really should be Bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth in our lives. Lord, let your kingdom come through me. That's where we're going. Where in the world did we start? Well, look in the beginning of the book. Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verses 27 and 28. God creates us. Would you just say... I'm created in the image of God. Genesis 1, 27 and 28. We know where we're going. Now where did we start? What was God's original plan? So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them. By the way, you are a blessed people. And he said to them, be fruitful an increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now there are three things that God said we are to rule over. What are they? Fish in the sea. Praise God for all you anglers out there that love to go fishing. God bless you. The birds in the sky. We're to have dominion over those. And every living creature that moves on the ground. He's not talking about anyone ruling over any other race. What's he saying? Be fruitful and multiply. Multiply physically, multiply the Spirit of God upon the face of the earth. But man got it wrong. Just a few chapters later, Genesis chapter 11, you have this Tower of Babel incident. And when man decides that he is going to try to fulfill God's mandate, God's call, his way, what usually happens? They usually mess it up. 
And so they decide they're going to build this this tower. They all come together and they're going to build this tower, this monument to mankind. Genesis 11.4 says, this is what the people said, so that we can make a name for ourselves. Where's God in all this? He's not. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. God says, if as one people, verse 6, speaking the same language, they have begun to do this, then there is nothing they plan to do that will be impossible for them. Verse 9, from there the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. God says, you cannot have your own agenda when you're trying to fulfill my purpose for your life. You can't do my agenda your way. So, what do we have? We have races trying to say, I'm superior because blah, 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 blah. Well, I am going to rule over you because blah, 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 blah. And we have all kinds of excuses. We have all kinds of reasoning. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because if you look in Genesis, we were, we all came from Adam and Eve. We came from one person created by God in the image of God. We messed it up. We all go our different ways. God says, look, I'm not going to allow you to stand up and try and fulfill my purpose your way. This isn't going to work. And we've been dividing ever since. If we forget why we started, then the lack of purpose makes us ineffective. Now, are we different? different? I've traveled all over the world. I've been to every continent except Antarctica. Now, there's not a lot of ministry to the penguins, so it would kind of be pointless for me to go down there. So, um, But anyway, I, I look wherever I go, and the diversity of people is absolutely incredible. I love it. I love the different foods. I've eaten crickets in Africa, or grasshoppers, I guess they call them. Grasshoppers for my snack. You know, Ed and I are driving along in a car with Rich and Ginger Jorgensen. We pull up, you know, instead of the guy out there with the little thing selling bags of chips, they've got little baggies with grasshoppers in them, dried grasshoppers that are salted. I'm like, sure, I'll try it, you know. I've eaten guinea pig head. I've eaten, I mean, it's just all kinds of stuff all over the world. People look different. They act different. They smell different. They have different social and cultural norms all of them serving the Lord you know what this is just a little sidelight in church when you hear people speaking in tongues it does not matter where you are in the world it sounds similar I, I've heard people speaking in tongues in all different cultures and it's like, wow, I recognize that language. But along the way, you have different preferences. Now, there's coffee. How many of you like coffee? Okay. Uh, coffee, um, I, I, think, I think Sheila, her email is more coffee for me. Um, and, and she gets my vote for the person who likes coffee the most in here. Um, and we could take a little survey of who spends most at Starbucks and that kind of thing too. So, But you have a lot of different kinds of coffee. Now, my father and my father-in-law do not like coffee. And I make a joke all the time, you know, hey, would you like a cup of coffee? Okay, you know, it's, oh yeah, yeah, we don't make a cup of coffee and stuff. You have people that like coffee. You have people that don't like coffee. You have people that, I only drink coffee black. You have only uh, people that say, well, I only drink it with cream and sugar. Well, I only drink it with frou-frou in. That's my wife. She likes a little bit of coffee with her creamer. Okay? It's, uh, if you ever want to bless my wife, give her a gift card to the creamer place, i.e. Kroger. Um, but some like light roast, some like dark roast, some like, well, bold, you know, it, it's got to be, if, if, honestly, if you, like, if you like Starbucks coffee, you like burnt coffee, okay? It's just uh, this the, way, it's the way it is, pretty much. But, but some people, that's the only way to drink a cup of coffee. It's got to be like, everybody has their opinion, right? And we talk about our opinion, and we sometimes talk badly about somebody else's opinion, don't we? Because, well, 
ugh, you like that coffee, you know, that kind of thing. It's one thing to talk about coffee. It's another thing to talk about people. Who are made in the image of who? God. Now there's a kind of coffee that I make a little bit of fun of. It's uh, How many of you know what the cat poop coffee is? Okay, it's, it's Kopi Luwak. It is a, an Indonesian coffee that the little, you know, road, I think it's a civet, um, goes and they, they eat the berries and then they honestly poop it out and the, they go and collect the beans because there's a certain enzyme that happens in the digestive tract of the civet. And then they grind it up and it's like $350 a pound if you get the organic, I mean, this is just crazy. The, the, that, that's like taking organic to a whole nother level right there, okay? That's what you call super organic. But, but they, they get this and then they, I guess, roast it and grind it up. You can, go, you can buy the green beans online, shipped from who knows where. Why, I know where, but anyway. It's, you, you get this kind of coffee, and how many of you would say that's kind of gross? Okay, all right. But people are paying $350 a pound for this stuff. Somewhere, somebody doesn't think it's gross. Diverse. Colombian coffee, I love Colombian coffee. My kids are from Colombia. But I like coffee from all over the world. The Hawaiian coffee was amazing coffee. It was just like, wow, this is fantastic. Kauai coffee, it was just, if you ever get a chance, it's, it's amazing. It's different than the Colombian coffee. But God has made us very diverse. And rather than putting somebody else's coffee down, or their race down, or thinking poorly of someone else, the church needs to appreciate we're all coffee. We're different flavors. God bless the cat poop coffee people. God bless you. You know, maybe I'll try a cup sometime. I don't know. So whether some of us are darker roast, whether some of us are lighter roast, you know. Did you know? I always thought that the darker roast coffee had more caffeine. It's the lighter roast that has the more caffeine. I, I couldn't, I didn't know that until this year. God has a plethora. I mean, it's not just the different coffee. It's the different people. But how many of you are glad that... God has a variety. I'm the variety. You're the variety. We are the body of Christ. How do we do this, church? Where we are today in the tension. If we know where we're going, where are we going? We started out in Genesis as made in the image of God, we messed it up, and we allowed the enemy to come in and make us think that it was about me. It is not about you. It is not about your skin color. It's not about your culture. It's not about your national heritage. It's about the blood of Jesus. Because he redeemed us. And what happened at the Tower of Babel where everybody got different languages, guess what? We were unified on the day of Pentecost when he gave us the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. What the enemy meant for division, God used as an opportunity for unity. So where are we now? Acts chapter 17. I love this passage of scripture because I think it gives us the sovereignty of God as well as the free choice. You know, there's this whole debate if you're a theologian. Is it the sovereignty of God or do we have free uh, free choice? My answer to that is yes. And here's why. You're going to look in this passage of scripture, and you're going to see here. Paul, Acts 17, 22 through, I'm going to read through 31. There's only enough room on the PowerPoint for a few verses. Paul then stood up in this meeting at the Oropagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walk around and I look carefully at your objects of worship... I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. 
So you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Pause there. I love the way Paul takes people where they are to where they need, from where they are to where they need to go. He starts with something that's already, they're already thinking about this. Verse 24. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands. And if he needed anything, as if he needed anything, rather he himself gave everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offering. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like silver or gold or stone or images made by human beings or human design and skill. He goes on to talk about God overlooking in the past our shortcomings on that. But I wanted to highlight that we are God's offering, we are God's, or his offspring, and that from every nation, they came from one man. So, sovereignty of God, he determines where, they're going to, where people are going to live, the borders, and so forth. That's God's sovereignty. On the very other hand of that, he says, verse 27, God did this so that they would seek him and find him, our choice. So you have sovereignty and choice right there, though he is not afar off. Yes, both end. Where are we now? What does it look like to live today in the world in which we find ourselves as a Christ follower? Well, there's, there's several options. Some people just say, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. I'm not going to say anything about this whole thing and it will go away. There's strikingly silent pulpits on this issue. I just read a survey this week about how few people have addressed this issue from a scriptural perspective. How few pastors have done this? Uh, we just had uh, Friday night, there was a group of pastors that met over in, in Virginia Beach to pray for our nation regarding this. What do we do? Well, some people blast every opinion that they have out on Facebook. And they're as divisive as the people who are trying to protest or speak about removing statues, flags, whatever. They're, they're just throwing division, and that is wrong, folks. If it's not going to bring unity, then we need to keep our mouth shut. Let me say it again. If it's not going to bring unity, then we keep our mouth shut. Keep your blasted opinion to yourself. And then take it to the cross. Crucify it. One creator, one redeemer... God's fruitful purposes are multiplied through diverse humans. I want you to hear this. We need the diversity that God has in the body of Christ. It's by design. Not an accident. Did you know, and I'm not a, I'm not a doctor, don't play one on TV, but I was reading about blood, and, and correct me, uh, nurse, nurses in our midst, cor correct me here if I get this out of whack. But it is my understanding that I can receive blood from anyone that has the same blood type as I have. Is that, is that correct? And, and there's other, I'm, oh, I believe, uh, so I can donate to people that couldn't, you know, how that works. There was this chart that was so confusing. Thank you for smart people that take care of all of that stuff so, you know, I don't get the wrong stuff. But 
It's like this. It doesn't say, oh, you can only get blood from a white organ donor because you're white, or not organ donor, hopefully not an organ donor when you go to get blood. Red Cross organ donors, that's great. But you get a, you get, I, wait, wait, let me make sure that I have this right. Your, your ethnicity. I, there's going to be a lot of people, like if, if they found out they got blood from a different race, that would be mortified. They'd die right there. Nobody who is dying, at least if they're in their right mind, would be laying there like bleeding out after an accident. They're one breath from death. They need six of their pints of blood out of their ten to be reinfused. Hold on a second. Is that from a person of a different race? Maybe there's crazies that do that. I don't know. But you're going to take it. How do we do this, church? The blood of Jesus has to bring reconciliation. The blood of Jesus is pumping through my veins. It's not blood that is dependent upon the color of my skin or the heritage or where I came from or what was... I mean, we, we just did our genetic thing, you know, and find out where we're, where we're from. Did you know that 48% of your people from Britain have O-type blood? Did you know that? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Your, your blood is passed down genetically, like your, your, your parents. It's just like that whole, like, the eye color thing. And there's certain people that can't have a kid. Like, we have a high chance of having Gavin and Hannah having type O blood because of our genetics. Here's the thing. What if Jesus' blood was the unifying factor for all of us? Does that sound good? There's a lot of people that need that. Let's not get distracted by all the stuff along the journey. Remember, remember this. If you want to, if you want to really get a handle on this, read the book of Galatians, because the book of Galatians talks a ton about this. But remember that we all came from one God, Genesis one. Remember that each of us have specific purposes, and we've been placed strategically around this globe. Acts seventeen. Remember that what happened at Babel in Genesis eleven that divided us because of our foolish pride was united under the day of Pentecost. Galatians 2.20 If you ever have a thought that is negative about another race, person, nationality, people group, area of the world, oh, those people. Be careful if you're using language like those people. That is an indicator that you got an issue. Oh, people like that. Check your heart. And then open Galatians, go to chapter 2, go to verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. Crucify the flesh, change your terminology, and let's live unified by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we need to build trust. You know, one of the one of the biggest things is when we don't know people, we fear people. We fear people that we don't know. If there's somebody that you're like, those people, okay, get to know one of those people. They're real, live, perspective Christ followers. Just like you. And persevere, folks. Don't give up. You know what I might not be able to see happen in my generation? I pray.
pray that my kids, I can pass something on to the next generation that will make it better for their generation than my generation, than your generation. Well, it's not looking like it's happening. I thought we were beyond this by now. Well, I'm just going to give up and go back to my corner and build my little wall. It's not going to destroy me. That's not what the cause of Christ has ever asked us to do as Christ followers. Galatians 3, 26-29 says, So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. You notice it didn't say through birth. It said through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. That means when people look at us, they don't see our skin color as much as they see Christ. That's what it's called to be clothed in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor nor free, male, nor male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Church, the issue of racism is not going away anytime soon unless the church steps up and does its God-given job. Paul was dealing with this. Peter was dealing with this. Go to the book of Acts with the Jews and the Gentile thing, and you see Peter. That's just a whole nother... Look it up. Peter? Paul? Is there a Mary here? I don't know. We have to do this today just as they did back then in the early days of the New Testament. It's not going away. The enemy comes to divide, but the church comes to unite. And if we don't do our job, what do we have left? We only have division and hatred. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to talk until I'm blue in the face. And I'm going to preach the word of God and the truth of God. And if it isn't heard, it does not change the truth. The truth is the truth is the truth. Lead the way, church. Show the world how it's done. Think and speak and act like where we're going. We're going to heaven. Let's act like it. Let's allow the truth to be reflected in our life. I don't ever want it to be said that we as a church were asleep at the wheel when God said, love your neighbor. Walk in unity. Claim the cause of heaven here on earth. I wrote a little prayer. And, and I want to I invite you to join me in, in leading this. But here's the prayer. God, I repent of any racist thoughts that I've had in the past. Renew my mind. Let me see every human through your eyes and with your purpose. Give me a love for people regardless of their earthly heritage. (laughs) Prepare my heart for heaven. Prepare my heart for heaven. What would it look like if we Every one of us as individuals decided we were going to live like heaven. 
Oh, it might not be this grand transformation in the state of Virginia because a few people on a Sunday morning decided to pray a prayer in a little place called Chesapeake. But what if we start it to live like heaven? Talk like heaven. Think like heaven. Reconcile ourselves to God. And then bring unity in the neighborhoods, in the places, in the cities where we live. I want you to stand if, 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 if this is something that you're willing. We sang the song, Army. <laughs> the Army, a soldier, soldier, army, whatever. It's the it's, it's same, same thing, right? If you are willing to be part of an army that has this as the heart for this season, I want you to stand. Because God wants to use you. He will use you if you are willing. Would you repeat this prayer after me? Or with me, I should say. God, I repent of any racist thoughts I have had in the past. Renew my mind. Let me see every human through your eyes and with your purpose. Give me a love for people regardless of their earthly heritage. Prepare my heart for heaven. Amen. Now that's like the swearing in soldiers in the army. Because God's going to take you up on this. He's going he's to convict us of little comments that we make along the way that are not unifying. He's going to convict us of Facebook posts that need to be taken down. He's going to convict us of some things that are just kind of, well, that was a little off color, but God will understand. And everybody, well, it's just, you know, who we're with or those kind of things. He's going to begin, he's going to put a gate gatekeeper at the door of the mouth and of the heart. And he's going to say, you know, as a church, we need to be, we need to be so over the top as, as an example, the world is watching us. How do we as Christ followers do this? You're now army. You're now in the army. Raise your right hand. Swear in. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Now we go do the real deal. Remember what we said here earlier? If it doesn't work in here then it probably shouldn't be exported out there. But this is the practice session. You will be tested. You will be going to battle, church. Now we get to do it. So I close with this wonderful scripture out of Romans 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I will see many of you and your families and all of them next week at Church at the Beach. Going to be talking out of Habakkuk as the waters cover the sea. So... The glory of the Lord will cover the face of the earth. Amen. Amen.